This video is sponsored by Factor. <laughs> hey there YouTubers. Today I'm gonna make my boat 300% more efficient with this toroidal propeller that I 3D printed on my 3D printer. Okay everyone, we're here at my boat now. So step one, we gotta take off the old propeller and now we can put on the new propeller. You freaking oh, idiot. Oh, oh. Ow, why are you hurting me? Because an FDM printed propeller will never be as good as a normal propeller, even if it's the best design in the world. Fact of the matter is, you could give the smartest engineers ever trillions of dollars to design the most efficient toroidal propeller possible. And if you FDM printed it on your Ender 3 or whatever and left the surface finish looking like this, it would still perform worse than Skippy's injection molded hat propeller. Ever since MIT came out with this publication about how toroidal propellers can make drones quieter, there have been loads of people on YouTube 3D printing various toroidal designs with their FDM printers and testing them out. Most of them look laughably bad, and it seems like people are expecting them to outperform normal off-the-shelf propellers. Spoiler alert, none of them do. I want to give toroidal propellers a better chance at proving out their high performance expectations, and luckily Formlabs offered to SLS print some for me, so that I can avoid having to FDM print them myself. FDM printers use a hot nozzle to extrude hot plastic while the part is built up in layers. SLS printers work by using a laser to center plastic powder particles together to form the part. The benefit of SLS is that you can print any shape without support material, and the parts are very strong compared to other 3D printing methods. That's not to say that good propellers can't be FDM printed, it just takes lots of post-processing. My boat has been running on these FDM printed propellers for quite a while, and they've been great. But it took a lot of sanding, fairing compound, more sanding, and epoxy to get them to the point where they're smooth enough to be comparable in performance with an off-the-shelf propeller. While I was designing my own toroidal propeller in Onshape, I was pretty hopeful that it would outperform my old propeller design, but I was also fairly skeptical of some of the claims that I had been seeing online. In the last few months there have been loads of tech channels trying to ride the toroidal hype wave that MIT started, and with that comes a bunch of clickbaity thumbnails. I'm pretty sure these are why so many people in the comment section of my videos seem to think toroidal propellers are going to swoop in from the heavens and save us all. Some of these are just crazy. I mean like, what even is that thing? It's definitely not a toroidal propeller, that's for sure. And nowhere have I seen data that says they're 138% more efficient. In fact, the MIT publication doesn't say that they're more efficient at all. It only says that they produce less audible noise while creating a comparable amount of thrust. As I was working on my design, and looking at it as one does, I noticed the two airfoil profiles were stacked in a way that was sort of similar to my multi-element airfoil project. Having multiple airfoil elements can help keep the flow attached, even at super steep angles of attack, and this can lead to a super high coefficient of lift. I couldn't help but wonder if this was one of the reasons why toroidal propellers are supposedly more efficient. To test this theory, I designed another propeller that was basically the same as the toroidal one, but the tip profiles terminate independently like a normal propeller, instead of wrapping around and combining together to form the toroidal loop. The root profile on both propellers is identical. There are plenty of arbitrary differences, so it's not a perfect comparison, but it still should be interesting. So after I had my designs, I sent them off to Formlabs to be printed with their Fuse 1 Plus. A few weeks later, a box of props arrived in the mail. To act as a control for the tests, I had them print my old three-bladed design as well. It's worth noting that the diameter of all these propellers is identical, so it should be a pretty fair comparison. These are all printed out of nylon. I was really impressed at how stiff they are. Listen to this, it almost sounds like they are made of ceramic or something like that. Here's one of the little hubs that fits on the spline of my motor shaft. These are printed separately so that I don't have to reprint the entire propeller if there are any tolerance problems or anything like that. The hubs were a bit tight fitting into the props themselves, so I had to take advantage of the built-in lathe yet again. The hubs screw into the props with six screws, and with that we have a pretty slick looking little thruster assembly. So then I took off the old props on my boat and put the new ones on, and it was off to the lake. You'll notice I have the solar panels mounted on my boat now, but that's a topic for a future video, so don't forget to subscribe. Here's another solar boat. I got a rooftop panel on this one. That's pretty nice. There's the mega yacht. That one used to look big and now it looks minuscule compared to that thing. So it's not even 7 a.m. and we're already getting 100 watts. The panel tilted up like that. 120 watts. And it's also pushing us per perfectly perpendicular to the wind. <laughs> there goes the float plane taking off downwind. It must not be windy enough to really matter. So I'm just kind of messing around with this battery efficiency measurement here. It's milliamp hours per kilometer and it basically measures the current that the motors are pulling and then it does some math combining it with the GPS speed measured by the GPS unit and the autopilot there and gives you a measurement of milliamp hours per kilometer. So that's basically your efficiency. Another seaplane coming in hot. 
damn, look at that thing. It almost looks like they had an old ship converted into a personal yacht. So I'm gonna use this little beach right here as a home base to swap propellers. Right now I have the three bladed standard props on there. So I'm just gonna restart the flight controller so the data of logging gets reset and then just do a big lap around the entire lake and then come back, switch props, do it again. And I'll just repeat that all four times. <laughs> it's gonna be a long day. Here we go, starting the test. So what I ended up doing for this test is putting the boat in steering mode so that the heading is being stabilized by the autopilot. The throttle on the other hand is not being controlled by the autopilot. I manually set the motor PWM command so that the motors are drawing a similar amount of power for each run. That way, the speed is our dependent variable and power is our independent variable. Looks like it's a busy day at the dry dock company. They're lifting some stuff with the crane. Got a big old Navy ship over here. So we're about halfway through the first test. I'm using landmarks to kind of mark my course around the lake here, different houses I'm bouncing off to make my turns. So we're gonna head to that big yacht and then turn back to the park and switch props. So for all our testing today, the boat's running on this 100 amp hour, 25 volt LIFE PO4 battery. Right now the solar panels are making about 400 watts and the motor is pulling about 350 watts. So hopefully the battery voltage will stay pretty constant throughout all of our tests today. That does matter because we're looking at milliamp hours per kilometer, not watt hours per kilometer. They don't have a watt hours per kilometer in here, which is kind of unfortunate. Here's our next contestants. I sure am excited to try these things out. It's gonna be quite interesting. The first thing I noticed when I put on the three bladed SLS printed props is that they're way smoother than these FDM printed props I was using before. And it's really strange because in air, these things are perfectly balanced. There's almost zero vibration. But in water, they vibrate a lot. What I'm thinking is that these blades must be asymmetrical. Like this thing is producing an asymmetrical thrust relative to the shaft. So after doing a lap around the lake with the standard SLS props, I pulled up to the beach and switched over to the toroidal props. I had no idea what to expect, but I was hoping they would push the boat along much faster for the same amount of power. So after I got both of those installed, it was time for another lap around the lake. Now, one big factor that's super difficult to control during efficiency testing like this is wind speed. But luckily, the winds seemed pretty consistent throughout the day, so I don't think there was much of any bias going on. It was a relatively calm day. First impressions are that they feel extremely smooth. There's almost no vibration compared to my FDM printed props. So these are the ones I just took off. I don't know if the toroidal propellers are any smoother than these, but they're both way better than the FDM printed props. I'm gonna warm up my factor meal in the sun because I don't have a microwave on my boat. Did you know that you can get pre-made meals shipped right to your door? Did you know this will save you time that would otherwise be lost on meal prep and going to the grocery store? Do you know how many more propellers you can 3D print with all that saved time? The answer is a lot. That's why I love Factor Meals. Their fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. It's so convenient. Choose online from over 34 chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options featuring premium ingredients such as broccoli, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Oh boy, oh boy. I'm excited for my lunch. Oh yeah. Woo! That's the stuff right there. Oh, um, wow. You guys, look what's behind you. A giant ship. How neat is that? This one is turkey, chili, and zucchini. And it's one of my favorites for sure. It's so good. It doesn't get much better than this. I'll tell you. Good day at the office. Factor is also super flexible. I can easily adjust my order size or even skip a week when I'm leaving town. Plus, you can round out your meals and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of over 45 add-ons, including these delicious smoothies. This summer, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals online and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered straight to your door. Head to factor75.com or click on the link below and use code RCTESTFLIGHT50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Now back to testing. Upon powering up the motors, I noticed that the toroidal props were pulling about 60 watts less power than these propellers. Now, that doesn't mean it's going the same speed. That's just based on the motor PWM setting. That doesn't necessarily correlate to efficiency, so we'll still have to do our lap around the lake and then look at the data and see if they're more efficient or not. So to compensate for this, I retrimmed the throttle PWM so that the motors were pulling the same amount of power as they were with the previous props. It was pretty interesting that the toroidal props are easier for the motors to spin with less rotational resistance. So this brings up the question, 
Was the extra energy being used by the other propellers all getting wasted as rotational resistance? Or were they effective in converting that energy into thrust? We'll have to wait and see. We got a goose chase. Look at them go. I'm winning. Winning this race. You got nothing on me, gooses. Look at that crusty old boat. The Pacific Hunter. It looks like it's decommissioned. Getting ready for scrap. This one probably too. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop. Look at that. Do you know what that is? That's a tip vortex. This is really significant because they say toroidal propellers are more efficient because of the reduction of the tip vortex. So this footage goes to show that it's not entirely eliminated, at least not with my design. Now I feel like this is a good time to talk about some of the design decisions that I made when I was pulling this propeller design straight out of my ass, which is exactly where it came from. I didn't do any CFD or optimizations or anything like that, so you can take this test with a grain of salt. One of the interesting things I had to think about was the angle of attack of the mid profile of the toroid. I chose to give it a slightly positive angle of attack, because this way it would generate lift outwards and push water inwards. The reason why I thought pushing water inwards might be good is that it could pull in extra water from the sides and increase the velocity of the prop wash. Increased velocity might lead to higher peak thrust, but not necessarily better efficiency. This is all just speculation. Now to argue against my design choice, if I were to have made the middle of the toroid have a negative angle of attack, it would push water outwards. This might make the flow kind of expand as it passes through the propeller, which would reduce the velocity of the prop wash. At first thought, this doesn't seem good, but this negative angle at the tip that pushes water outwards is also known as a winglet, which are commonly used on airplanes to approve the efficiency. It's the same principle, they also push air outwards. Now with no winglet, the high pressure from the bottom of the wing wraps around to fill the low pressure on the top of the wing. This is what causes a wingtip vortex. Vortices are bad because they take energy to make, and this is energy that gets taken away from the plane. When the winglet is added, it pushes air outwards, which fights against the vortex rotating up from the bottom. This results in a weaker vortex and a more efficient airplane. Same deal with the toroidal propeller. You might have a vortex that would be doing something like this, and the tip would be pushing air outwards and fighting against it. If that's true, maybe I should have given the middle of the toroid a negative angle of attack rather than a positive one like I did. Now this is all just total speculation. I'm a YouTuber, not an aerospace engineer, so if you really care about the technical details here, don't listen to me. Coming in for a landing. It's getting closer to noon and it looks like we're doing 430 watts from the solar panel. That's pretty good. Back to the nerd stuff for just a sec. While I was looking at this view here, I had another idea. Maybe this section of the toroid is pushing air this way, and this section is pushing air this way. Look at those angles. That's like half a wingtip vortex already. I have no idea if that's what's really going on, but if it is contributing to the vortex, it could potentially be making the toroidal propeller less efficient. Just a thought I had. So next we're going to try out these things. Definitely quite an abnormal boat propeller. So I'm calling this design the bi-blade propeller. Okay, let's go. When I went to trim the throttle so that the motors were pulling the same amount of watts as with the other propellers, I noticed that these bi-blade props were drawing 20 watts more power than the toroidal propellers, and 40 watts less power than the standard props. These ones also feel extremely smooth. I didn't see any tip vortexes with the bi-blades, but we'll test that more later on. These props are spinning fast, I promise. It's just the high shutter speed of the camera that makes them look slow. It's high noon and I'm doing 450 watts from the solar panels. That's pretty good. Okay, we're rolling into home base here and we're going to switch over to the two bladed FDM propellers. I initially wasn't planning on testing these FDM props, but I thought, you know what? It's a beautiful day and I have unlimited free energy from the sun. So what's another lap around the lake, huh? Let's give it a go. My color choices here have nothing to do with Ukraine. I just really like yellow and blue. Now this is kind of an unfair comparison to the other props because these ones are sanded and painted with epoxy so that they're glassy smooth. The SLS props have a pretty matte textured surface and I decided to leave it as is because it would have taken a lot of sanding to get them smooth. And if they all have the same surface finish then it's still a fair comparison. Once I find which propellers perform best, I'll sand them smooth and use them on my boat until the next breakthrough propeller shape is invented. We're getting max solar power now. 500 watts. Amazing. That means we're charging the battery at 150 watts because the motors are pulling 350 watts. Coming in hot. And another one. You can hardly see that house because they have so many plants around it. Wild. And it's all floating too, that's crazy. One of the really weird things about this propeller is that this lower blade here is actually swept forward. So it's like angled forward, you know, like that one weird fighter jet. 
It's very abnormal, um, especially for a propeller. So yeah, this is just all around a super odd design. If I put sunscreen on my solar panels, will they make less power? The best part about all this is that if you want any of these propeller designs, you can have them for free. I designed them in Onshape, which is a cloud native CAD platform that makes sharing files super easy. So to get access to these, all you gotta do is click on the link in the description and create an Onshape account for free. Then you'll have access to all the source sketches and everything. So you can go in and tweak every little dimension and make changes and do whatever you want to these propellers. So again, check the link in the description and create a free Onshape account and start messing with these yourself. How much drag in milliamp hours per kilometer do you think this hat makes? Probably like five. Look at that, there's a sand barge coming through. Wow, that must have so much inertia. Wonder how long it takes to stop. Those kayakers better watch out. And we're going home, back to the dock. Time to review the data. So when I got home and checked the SD card in the autopilot, there was no data on it. This wasn't a huge issue though, because I also had all the telemetry data that Mission Planner had logged. However, on a few of the runs, it must have started feeding data into the milliamp hours per kilometer equation before the boat was moving, because the values started out weirdly small and then gradually got bigger and bigger. This is a problem though, because if super small numbers are a part of the data set, then it's going to screw up the readings for the whole run. So what I ended up doing was manually going through and pulling out power and velocity data from various locations from each lap, and then averaging them together to get watt hours per kilometer. And here's the data. This seems right to me. It correctly reflects how I felt each propeller design was doing during the tests, so I feel pretty confident about it. For those of you who, like myself, don't math too good, big rectangle, bad. Small rectangle, good. The toroidal propeller performed the worst, and the FDM propellers with the smooth glossy surface finished performed the best. Despite feeling good about these results, I didn't feel like I put enough thought into planning these tests to begin with, so I decided to redo it. Welcome back to the science boat for another day of testing. This time around, I programmed the boat to hold a consistent speed, so that speed is our independent variable and power is our dependent variable. Additionally, I'm using a separate flight controller to log the data, so that I can arm and disarm it to start and stop the data acquisition while the boat is already moving. This will eliminate the issue from yesterday where it was factoring bad data into the milliamp hours per kilometer equation. So I have a lot more batteries today because I'm trying to keep the voltage as consistent as possible for all the tests. I've got these two AO Lithium 12 volt batteries wired in series, and those are connected to all of these 24 volt batteries that are in parallel. They're in parallel with the ones in series over here. You're not really supposed to do that, but it's fine. And then it gets even jankier over here. I have this one big EcoFlow that's running this lab bench top power supply that's charging everything at about 270 watts. And then we're also getting about 80 watts from the solar panels right now, even though it's cloudy. Look at that boat, wowee. So yeah, this lab bench top power supply has actually worked pretty well at keeping the voltage of these bigger lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, pretty high, like almost full. So cruise control is set at 1.6 meters per second and we're utilizing 300 and about 300 and I don't know, 80 watts to do that speed. So this little uh, lab benchtop power supply right here is doing 270 watts. So it's providing most of our power, which is kind of hilarious. So once again, I used this beach as a home base to swap between all four types of propellers. There goes the Coast Guard. I wonder if they've got toroidal propellers. Nope. The data from last time suggested that the toroidal propellers were less efficient. And it's kind of looking like we're getting the same results today. We're pulling like 630 watts to go 1.6 meters per second. And there's not any more wind than there was on the last run, so it definitely seems like they're using a lot more power to do the same speed. Let's double check that our speed is actually 1.6 meters per second. Sure is. So the weather is not exactly cooperating. Everything is wet now, it's misting real hard. At least it's not windy though. I put a trash bag over the computer to try and keep it dry. Yeah, it's just unpleasant. I'm all wet, boat's all wet, no good. Despite the wetness, the data looks good for the most part. Here's a look at our independent variable. It looks like the autopilot did a pretty good job at keeping the boat right around 1.6 meters per second for all but the biblade run. I have no idea why, but there was more error for that one but it still looked like it would average out at about 1.6 meters per second. So here's the milliamp hours per kilometer data straight from the logs. We have the same results as the previous day, but the difference in efficiency seems to be more significant. Maybe this is because the boat was heavier with more batteries and rainwater. Not sure. After that, I used a program called Mavexplorer to get watt hours per kilometer graphs out of the data. 
Here's the data from all four runs. And here it is all averaged together. It pretty much looks identical to the milliamp hours per kilometer graph. The toroidal prop was the worst and the smooth prop was the best. Big surprise. Totally didn't need to waste all day redoing the tests. Oh wowee, the fire boat is squirting. Oh, that was a pirate ship. After that round of testing, I tried to do some higher speed testing, and I was able to get upwards of like 2.5 or 3 meters per second with the normal propellers, but I only had 24 volt batteries with me on this day, and I really need more voltage to go much faster. I've tested on a 12S before, but I really need a 20S to get max performance out of these motors and ESCs. One interesting thing was that with the toroidal and biblade props, I couldn't even get the boat going faster than like 1.8 meters per second, and at that speed, I was hitting the current limit on the ESCs. Oh, that's a baby goose. Mmm, we got chicken mush for lunch today. When I went to Nepal a few years ago, I saw people eating with their hands for the first time. And at first it was kind of startling, honestly. Like, you never see that in Western countries. But then I realized that it's actually kind of nice to have your hands smell like curry all day. Oh, there's a duck. Hi, duck. Oh, geez, that's an aggressive duck. Look at that, it's attacking me. That duck's not even very nice. Look at that. Look at that. I probably shouldn't be feeding this duck rice. The waterfowl experts say only Wonder Bread. After that, I taped a tube onto the motors and ran it up to my mouth so that I could blow air down into the propellers and better visualize the flow. With the standard prop, you can clearly see that there's quite a bit of vortex action going on. It looks awesome, but these vortexes are not great for efficiency. In this shot here, there's even a vortex clinging onto the center of the prop. How cool is that? Looks like a snake. Here's some really crisp vortexes. It takes energy to make these things, and that's energy that's not going into pushing the boat forward. That's why they're bad. With the biblade propeller, it looks like the air bubbles get blended up much more. This would suggest that there's more turbulence around the blades. It even looks like bubbles are clinging onto the blades as they spin. To me, this seems like it indicates that the blades are stalled. If this is true, it could totally be why these props are not performing as well as the standard props. One thing worth noting is that I was filming this while putting like 1500 watts into each motor, way more power than during the efficiency tests. So if the blades are stalled now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were stalled during all the testing. The toroidal props had a similar result, but with fewer vortices visible around the tips. I wasn't seeing any of the acute vortexes I was seeing on the toroidal propeller yesterday. Again, probably because this time the props were spinning way faster. If we slow it way down, you can see how the bubbles are sticking to the forwardmost blade of the toroidal propeller. So yeah, it was probably stalled. The vortices we saw on the normal propellers aren't good for efficiency either, but they're nowhere near as bad as a stall. So, why were the blades stalled? My guess is that it's a combination of the angle of attack, cord length, and airfoil profile. If we go into onshape and measure the pitch of the blades, you can see that we're looking at about 35 degrees at the root. This is pretty steep, but it doesn't seem like it's too steep. Most speedboat propellers have similarly steep, if not steeper, pitch at the root. The blades twist as they go outwards, and in the middle they were at 26 degrees. The way I was using these propellers is about as far from speedboating as you can get, so I definitely should have designed them with a lower pitch. I was initially hoping to do higher speed tests with them, but that just didn't work out. I think maybe one of the biggest problems with these props was the airfoil profile. Typically, props get really sharp at the tips, and mine were pretty chubby in comparison. I made the decision to keep them a bit thicker due to the fact that they were just going to be made out of plastic, not metal. The profile at the top looks more like a banana than an airfoil profile, and the one at the bottom looks much worse. If it were easy to make a nice airfoil profile throughout the toroidal loop, I would have done that, but it's not easy. Or at least, my CAD skills are not quite at that level. The profiles of the biblades are identical to the toroidal propeller at the root, but they are a bit better at the tips. The trailing edge is probably still too thick to perform well. Let's compare all this to the normal propeller I was testing against. It has a 29 degree pitch angle at the root, for comparison, that's 6 degrees less than the other props. And at the tip, the pitch angle goes down to 18 degrees. Furthermore, it has a much deeper cord, and a deeper cord can deal with higher angles of attack without stalling as easily. The other props had a much shorter cord length, so this makes them more likely to stall. This is the same reason why you never see an airplane with a high aspect ratio wing flying at high angles of attack, like this deep cord delta yak that I built when I was little. So after these two days of testing, I've learned that my toroidal propellers suck. Does this mean that all toroidal propellers suck? No, absolutely not. If you believe the data that Shero Marine puts out about their propellers, then it's possible that toroidal propellers could be upwards of twice as efficient as a normal propeller at certain speeds. Now, I'm not saying that they're fudging their numbers or anything like that, but in general, when any given company is trying to sell you a product, I always just try and automatically assume that the numbers are getting fudged a little. Again, I'm not saying their data isn't true, but I would just like to see more data from unbiased sources. 
I've only been able to find one form post from someone that seemed like they had no financial stake in their claims, and they saw an 11% efficiency increase at displacement speeds and a 1% efficiency increase at planning speeds. This is really interesting because most of Sharo's data suggests that they are seeing the biggest improvement at mid-range planning speeds, not slow speeds, so it's kind of backwards. Also, I couldn't help but notice that some of the stuff on their website totally smells like marketing BS. Here they say most of the boat noise is caused by tip vortices. Are you sure about that? I mean, I've never heard an underwater tip vortice before. All I hear when I'm on a boat is engine noise and water splashing. Now, it would make sense that the boat would be quieter if the engine is running at less RPM to achieve that speed, but noise from the tip vortex? I mean, come on. That's only a thing with air propellers. Again, I don't know anything about this company, so I probably should just give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're great and all that. And again, I'm just a YouTuber with a shitty electric boat, so don't trust me on anything. But it would be nice to get some real unbiased scientific data on this stuff, like with a detailed test procedure and all that. Because after all, a 105% efficiency increase is a huge claim to make. When I see that a propeller is this much more efficient, I can't help but wonder why it's not more commonly used. The maritime transportation industry uses hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of fuel every single day. You would think that if there was a magical propeller out there that would just hand them even just like 5% more fuel efficiency, then the economic incentives of adopting that propeller design would be more than enough to make it happen, even if it costs way more to manufacture. Then again, Shero is a relatively new company, so maybe it will just take more time for their design to catch on. I wouldn't be all that surprised if we do start seeing cargo ships using toroidal propellers in the next few years. Now, Shero Marine does hold a patent for this propeller design, so that could be why it's not more commonly used. The speed at which it gets adopted by the maritime industry is limited by the speed at which they can scale up their manufacturing operation, so maybe it'll catch on over time. It's kind of funny, I didn't see this patent until after I had already received my toroidal propellers in the mail, but the drawing in their patent looks way more like the ones I drew up in CAD than it does any of the propellers that they currently sell. Most of theirs have way more of a rake to them, or sweep in the airplane world. Their patent also covers drone propellers, so it'll be interesting to see if they go after Foxeer or any other companies that are trying to sell toroidal drone propellers. Foxeer recently started selling this propeller that they call the Donut, and it seems to perform no better or worse than any other standard FPV propeller. Although, I have heard a lot of people say that they really aren't any quieter, like the MIT paper said they might be. So back to my design. It is a bit of a bummer that my boat didn't instantly get 105% more efficient, but that's not really unexpected. To design an efficient propeller, it takes a lot of testing and iteration on the design, and these days, CFD is a big part of it. I did none of this for my design, so yeah, no surprise that it didn't turn out working very well. Well, we're back out on the lake again. I was having nightmares that the rough surface finish on the SLS props was causing them to stall and screwing up the tests. So last night I sanded them, and today we're gonna test them out again. You probably thought I was done with science. But let me tell you something, gosh darn it, I'm never done with science. I'm about to get run down by a seaplane. So what I did last night was painted these props with epoxy and let it cure. And then this morning I sanded them down smooth. Now if you look closely, they look kind of scratched, but I can assure you that they feel extremely smooth to the touch. So I did both of the three bladed normal props and then I did one of the toroidal props. Um, I'm going to do an efficiency test with the normal three bladed props so that I can compare the raw surface finish to the new sanded surface finish. But I also did one of the toroidal props just so that I can see if it was the rough surface finish that was causing the flow separation and the cavitation around the blades. I won't bore you with more testing footage, so let's just jump to the results. Here's the watt hour per kilometer measurement for each lap. The two bladed prop was still more efficient. This is not surprising though, because in general, it's common that the fewer blades a propeller has, the more efficient it will be. More blades can lead to higher peak thrust, but fewer blades is better for efficiency. So the two bladed prop was 13% better. This is only a 1% improvement from yesterday when it was 14% better. These results suggest the surface finish isn't super important, but I'm not sure I totally trust this data. To have more confidence in the result, I would need to do more test runs for more data points. I'm using the two-bladed props as a control here. I can't really compare the non-sanded three-bladed props to the sanded three-bladed props across two different days because the boat weighed different amounts on each day. The thought of going the rest of my life with inefficient boat propellers has really put me into a state of depression. Like, what if I just never achieve my dreams? And it's all just because my boat isn't efficient enough. I can't let that happen. So, I have these. Whoa, <laughs> wait, are those airplane propellers? 
Yeah, they are. I've seen people on the internet use airplane propellers on low RPM boat motors, and apparently they're really efficient, so I'm gonna give it a try. So these are XOR wooden propellers, and the propellers in their default form just won't fit on these motors. The shaft is too wide. So I had to get creative here and machine some brackets on my Stepcraft M1000 out of carbon fiber, and I also machined the propellers themselves. I had to build a nice little fixture to hold the propeller while the end mill went in and drilled four holes and then cut off one of the blades. So now we have these wooden blades mounted out further from center, and that allows me to attach them to this uh, spline hub thing I've been using. I don't really know what to expect efficiency-wise, but I do expect that the motors will have a lot more rotational resistance and not want to spin very fast. And I think if I do try and force them to spin very fast, these things might just snap. So I'm guessing that they're going to be good for low speed efficiency, but not for high speed driving whatsoever. We'll see. So obviously there's going to be a ton of drag around the center section, but that's fine for now. This is just going to be a quick test. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking that you can't just slap a huge propeller onto a motor that's designed for a smaller one, and generally that's true. But in this case, these motors are using field-oriented control, more specifically the VESC motor control software, and they're operating in torque control mode, so the motor doesn't care what RPM it's spinning at, it's just trying to hit its torque set point. So that should work in theory, but will it work in real life? Let's find out. I'm a little concerned because there seems to be a lot of like ultra low frequency vibration. I don't even know if we're gonna be able to hit the target speed for the efficiency test, which is 1.6 meters per second. Let's try it, throttling up. One problem that I didn't foresee was that the, the diameter of the prop is so big that the tips get really close to sticking out of the water. Throttling up. Oh God, the whole, oh God, the motors are jiggling. Oh no, I don't know about this. They're really vibrating bad. This is no good. Let's try and put it in speed control mode. Oh! Nope, 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 nope. Too much vibration. Not good. I'm not gonna do that. That's sketchy. <laughs> My motors are gonna fall off and the steering servo is gonna strip. Damn! I was really hoping that would be super efficient. Look at that, it's a steamship. I'm gonna do a little test here and see how smooth they spin in the air. It's funny. They seem pretty smooth in the air, so I don't think it's a balance issue. My guess is that the vibration is caused by when the blade passes through the turbulence that's caused by this part here. While blowing air into the props, I noticed bubbles sticking to the forward surface, just like they were doing with the toroidal propellers. So maybe the blades are stalled? I'm not actually sure if bubbles clinging to the blades are a cause or effect of a stall. It's possible that the blade could briefly stall out when it chops through the big pocket of air, and then the bubbles just cling to the turbulence for a while. I think I'll revisit this high aspect ratio blade stuff in a future video, but for now, this video is already way too long, so let's move on. I wanted to get some underwater footage of the sanded toroidal propellers in hopes the smoother surface finish would eliminate the stall or whatever was causing bubbles to stick to the blades. The answer is no. Also, if I screw with the frame rate to make it match the RPM, we can more clearly see what's going on. It looks like a stall or cavitation or something is originating at the root of the upper blade. Here's lower RPM. Looks like it's still happening. The standard prop looks like it has a little bit of clinging bubbles too, but not nearly as bad, and only near the root. The reason why this video is so much better than the underwater video from yesterday is it was more sunny on this day, so the camera's shutter speed was higher. So remember how earlier in this video I was talking about how I wasn't sure if I gave the center profile of the toroid the correct angle of attack? Yeah, so while well, I was reading through the patent that Shero Marine has on these propellers, and it turns out they actually do have a positive angle of attack, just like my propeller. So that was great to hear. It means my propeller is more representative of theirs. And also they really have a lot of data and details on all the different angles throughout the profiles in the toroid. And that was re really reassuring to me. It kind of suggests that they truly did all the research and development work to make these propellers super efficient. So I don't think they're selling snake oil. I think they are legit and I think their propellers are legitimately more efficient, but I would just like to see more data on it because like 105% efficiency gain is a huge claim. And for all I know, the props they were comparing against could have been some of the worst props out there. Maybe if they compared their toroidal propellers to some super high-end regular propellers, they would have been much less impressive. Not sure. 
So at the very last second, on the same day I uploaded this video, I got the chance to run these propeller models through AirShaper, which is a super easy to use cloud-based simulation program for aerodynamic analysis. I didn't have enough time to really dive into the results, but at a glance you can see that the surface flow lines of the regular propeller look pretty much like you would expect them to, nice and laminar. However, if we take a look at the toroidal propeller, the lines are kind of all over the place. The most interesting thing I saw was at the root of the front blade, we have a lot of spanwise flow going on, not cordwise flow like you would want on a propeller. I interpreted this as meaning the root of the blade has way too much sweep. If the blade entered the hub at more of a perpendicular angle, we might have avoided this problem altogether and maybe even prevented the stall that I was seeing on the underwater footage. This explains why normal boat propellers have these lobe-shaped blades, where the root comes out of the hub at a perfectly perpendicular angle or even is swept forward in some cases. Super interesting stuff! On the normal propeller, I noticed a high pressure area at the trailing edge on the top of the blade, and a low pressure area on the trailing edge on the bottom of the blade. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but maybe if I could find some way to eliminate this, the performance could be improved even further. So I've been doing all these tests with this Power Queen 25 volt 100 amp hour LIFE PO4 battery, and this one's really nice because it doesn't cut out like all my other ones do. With the other ones, if you give it too much throttle, the BMS trips and it does like an overcurrent fault or something like that. But this one, I've been able to go up to like 3,500 watts and it keeps going, so that's awesome. So now we're gonna have a little fun. I've got this Duck Battery 12S8P battery connected, we're reading 49.6 volts. We're gonna see how fast we can go. And we're also gonna see if these SLS props can handle the power. And that's full throttle at 5,000 watts right there. 2.5 meters per second and the ESCs are already going into thermal fold back so when they get too hot the power drops and then makes weird noises apparently <laughs> but we can hit 5,000 watts for a little while so I just need to get liquid cooling going on these motor drivers have tubes in them for liquid cooling I just don't have it set up yet these also take up to a 20s lipo and these motors are rated for a 20s max so in order to hit full power with this setup I need a bigger battery wow wait, look at that thing what do you mean you can't just FDM print a propeller? Look how fast that thing is going. Wow, someone owns that thing. He just drives it around for fun. I promise we're finished prop testing. Hope you learned something. I sure did. Thanks for watching. Bye.